All right. Hello, Fortinos brothers and sisters. Welcome back to Ministry Revealed. It is June 29th, 2024. Oh my goodness, it's almost July. On Monday, actually, being Canadian, it is our Canada Day celebration on uh, July 1st. So it's a long weekend for us up here. And I know this coming week, July 4th, will be the U.S. Uh, uh, holiday week or weekend coming up. So very, very exciting times. And brothers and sisters, we're going to have some fun here tonight as well. We're It's just, it's just going to be the, the awesomeness of the revelations that we've seen. I've had a, a couple questions and comments in relation to things surrounding the transfiguration story. And I had another one uh, where somebody had, or Sister Faye had sent me uh, a question and something that she had noticed in relation to the story of the wine. Okay. The story of the, the last supper and the institution of, of the wine and, you know, all of that stuff. And, so I noticed a couple things. She had shared something in that. And as I started going through it, I found some other little nuggets kind of in what she was leading to what she had seen. And uh, it fit in perfect with the things that I wanted to go into with a focus on the transfiguration story. Because what we're going to notice, we're not going to go into absolutely everything after the transfiguration story. But what you're going to notice is there's a similar same type of thing going on that we did in uh, Surrounding the Mustard Seed, where we're seeing the the events that are laid out within the chapter are purposely laid out in their prophetic typology. That what we're going to see and what what is built into the mystery behind those words or within those words is is revealing these events that we know the transfiguration story relate to and the fact that luke has a chunk of stuff before it that mark has only one thing before it and that matthew has nothing before it is all prophetically relevant it is so wild to see guys this it's just i know we've done videos on the transfiguration we've got videos like where it combines with other things. and But this is just going to be the transfiguration and then a little add-on about the wine. And we're going to spend our time kind of going through it, even though we've spoke on it in a video here, in a video there, in part here, in part there. It'll just all be now here in this one video, to be in this one teaching, to be able to see how it lays out in the prophetic. Guys, it is so awesome. It is so, so incredibly exciting. Once you see, once you can understand the revelations being revealed here, it's, it's not just about, about seeing it. What happens is there's a change that happens within us. We get excited for the word more than we ever have in our lives because there's an understanding that comes with it. It's not just reading it and, and trying to understand well, this. It, I, why is this saying that and this thing? Why is that that way? And this is this way. And, you know, once that opens to you as to why there are these differences in the Gospels, people come alive. They get hungrier and hungrier and hungrier for the word than they ever have before. I get emails and comments all the time. And I've had so many over the years because it is what the revelation does. It draws us closer to the Lord. It gets us so on fire because we can now read. For those that have diligently and desired to understand prophecy, so much is now opened. And you have the ability with the revelations to be able to go in and dig for yourselves and to share them with others here in the ministry and, and pinpoint and, and try to understand where these things really are, how they play out, how it applies. It's absolutely incredible. It doesn't mean that we know everything. It just, what we can prove is that we can show that there's been more revealed prophetically here in this ministry than has ever been made known before. That's why when, when you see it and when you understand it and you start seeking and searching it and you pray over it and you ask for the Spirit to open up your understanding, 
and you start seeing it here and you start seeing it there. It fires you up for the Lord. That fire within just is ignited. And you just want to spend that time seeking and searching him out more. Because it's not just in the Gospels, though that's where we're going to cover a lot of our time today. It is from the beginning of Genesis to the end of Revelation. It is so incredibly powerful. Man, I love it. I know so many of you love it. And that's why what we're going to do tonight is just spend some more time in him discovering and revealing and tying it all together in relation to the transfiguration as well as the wine from the Last Supper just to see how perfectly it ties in in relation to pre, mid, and post all being true connected to Luke, Mark, and Matthew. It is just wild, wild, wild. And we've been able to do this for almost seven years now, revealing hundreds and probably a couple thousand now of connections that have all proven it out true. So if you're new to the ministry, just hold on tight because what you're going to hear here tonight, it, you'll be able to track it, but it's definitely going to have you saying, what on earth is this guy talking about? So what I always recommend is coming either to the playlist here on YouTube, which is this one right here, the Revealed End Time Study Note series, and you can watch the first four videos there, or you can go to ministryrevealed.com, which you can click from right here, and come to ministryrevealed.com. This is the home page. Come over here, click on Intro. The other thing you can do is you can come and join us. There's about 1,200 plus uh, like-minded brothers and sisters from all over the world in, uh, in prayer requests and news and events going on around the world and ministries, outreaches, uh, Bible studies, all sorts of things. You can click on the form right here and sign up for five or ten seconds. It'll take you uh, absolutely no charge and you can come and join us in there um, and just be with like-minded brothers and sisters from around the world seeking and searching the Lord out in his prophetic revelation. The other thing, as you saw me do, I just click now on the intro. And the first four videos here are the same four in order from the YouTube channel. This one here is a 22-minute intro that will begin to give you a little bit of insight into what the next three videos will be about. Everything, our brother uh, Jimmy, who does our website for us. He is so awesome. I've had so many compliments over the years. My wife and others, when they share the website with people, uh, they just say, wow, this is a beautiful website. So that's uh, all thanks to Jimmy. I have zero part in any of that. He is our, our magic man when it comes to uh, the technology. So, and the reason I'm bringing that up is you could watch right here with a one-click watch and this download button right here <clears throat> excuse me, is a one-click download. So you can download these videos on any device you're watching from with a single click. That's how awesome it is. So the second video is a 30-minute Bible study. It's just an introduction to see what we call who the Gospels are speaking to. There are differences within the Gospels, like the Synoptic Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. You, if, if you've read your Scripture... If you've read the Gospels, you will know that there are clear differences within the same stories and events that, that would seem to have to be the same thing. Yet we've got three synoptic Gospels giving the stories, all three of them slightly different. The answer is prophecy. And when you begin to see it, as you will in here, in a simple 30-minute Bible study, there's notes that you can download or follow along and read and make notes on as you're doing it. It'll blow you away. There's a few simple ones that we that we like to go into in that. One of them is, you know, when you go to the three Gospels, Luke, Mark, and Matthew, you see that in Luke, Jesus is arrayed in a gorgeous robe. The, the Strong's Concordance means white, beautiful, radiant. It, it's like a like a bridal ground. It's so beautiful and white. In Mark, he's arrayed in purple, and in Matthew, before going to the cross, he's arrayed in scarlet. Pretty wild, right? White, purple, and scarlet. Yet white is the color of a bridal gown, a gorgeous, white, beautiful robe, and purple and scarlet are tribulation colors. 
Wild, right? Because purple and scarlet are the colors of the woman riding the beast, right? That's she's she's arrayed in purple and scarlet. Tribulation colors. So you're you're gonna begin to understand what this means just in this 30 minute intro to to begin to to absorb and understand what's happening. Because what you're gonna realize after that is that if all these differences are painting a prophetic picture of the end, you're going to realize that it's painting a prophetic picture of three groups of people being spoken to. Luke is the pre-trib bride of Christ. Marx is to what, we, what you would call the world, which is the house of Israel and the Gentiles that are grafted in. It also includes the church that's that's asleep, that wasn't really seeking the Lord. They're not diligent. They may claim to believe in him, but they spend no time with him except occasionally maybe at church on Sunday. OK, not everybody that goes to church, but I'm talking about the majority. So that's called the world, the house of Israel with the Gentiles grafted in. And then what you realize is what everybody else knows already is that Matthew is written to the Jews, which is the house of Judah. That's what it starts to reveal. And it sounds, it, when you first hear this, it sounds, what? It, it, the scriptures aren't talking to different groups of people. No, the scriptures are talking to everybody, for everybody, always. But the prophetic differences throughout the Gospels are 100% clearly speaking to different groups of people in their portion of time in the end of days. So what do you think that means? If there's Luke, Mark, Matthew, spirit, light, flesh, spirit, uh, son, father, right? Pre, mid, post that everybody disputes. It's because they're all true. And you'll begin to understand that revelation in this 30-minute intro. Once you get through the four, four videos, then you can come down here. This one is a three-hour deep dive into these differences of the Gospels that this one touches on. The third video is another 30-minute intro that you will start to easily much more easily begin to understand when you start with the Gospels and you notice those differences that when you go to the discourses, wait a second, then that means the differences in the wordings of the discourses being different is probably because they're different portions of people at different times, which equal what? Well, you'll realize that because nobody understood who Marx was really speaking to or Luke's, and they all focused on Matthew's, they only saw seven years. That's why everybody goes to Matthew 24 and not Mark 13. They only see seven years of tribulation. When you realize there's a portion for Mark, which is the world, the house of Israel, Gentiles grafted in, you'll realize there's another seven years that the world missed. Pretty wild, right? Right now, it sounds crazy if you're new, but that's what you're going to realize. Luke, Mark, Matthew, pre, mid, post. Luke's being different than Mark's and Matthew's even completely different is his portion relates to a period called above the 14 year portion. And it's a period of 50 days, which more specifically focuses on 40 days of those 50 days. Okay. But you're going to realize the tribulation is really 14 years and not seven. And this 30 minute intro will begin to prove it out to you so you could see it for yourself. Then this fourth video is the big one. It's two hours and 45 minutes long. And it is worth every moment of your time, just like the others, because it'll help you to understand why these things had never been understood or seen before. One, because it wasn't yet the timing. And two, was because for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, through seminary schools, all of these teachings, all of the theologians, everything over hundreds of years, they all taught from the Gospel of Matthew. And everybody's foundation for hundreds of years has been founded in Matthew's Gospel. About 90% of all teachings come out of the Gospel of Matthew. And uh, seven or eight out of Mark, and maybe two or three at most, out of the Gospel of Luke. Because they always based everything off Matthew, 
and they used Mark as the little other fill in the blanks and Luke as the little other tie ins to what they teach of from Matthew. And because the world has been taught from the is foundation in Matthew, never having understood Mark and Luke's portion, they've missed the other seven years and above portion. And all they've seen was the final seven. It's wild. It's absolutely wild. You will understand just like was, is, and is to come. Was is from the beginning creation to Christ. Is is from Christ until the pre-trib. And from the pre-trib until the end is the is to come. Was, is, is to come. And they've been teaching all of it from Matthew's portion in, in an is foundation. Okay, most churches, 90 plus percent of churches teach in the is view of things, how to live your life, how to, you know, to be in Christ and living your life for Christ and so forth. And so they do it from a from a, a picture of Matthew and barely pull from Mark and even less from Luke, as I said a moment ago. And so when prophecy people go to dig into prophecy, they're doing it from the same foundation of the is through the lens of Matthew. And I would say none of them are even aware of it. So when you begin to understand who the Gospels are speaking to, all of this will open up. It's absolutely mind-blowing. And like I said, it'll be truly worth every moment of your time. And you can do that. You can watch those four from the playlist right here or by clicking on ministryrevealed.com. So let me close that out. Now, with that, Let's get this going. This last one, man, if you guys hadn't seen that, if you're newer to the ministry or new to the ministry and you still haven't watched The White Horse Rider Revealed, I'm telling you, you want to go watch it. It's very exciting to be able to see it and to understand. From one verse of Scripture, we are able to prove through the rest of Scripture who the White Horse Rider is. And when his portion of time is and how long he's here for. <laughs> it sounds crazy, but I promise you, you will get it if you watch that intro series first and then you come and watch the White Horse Rider Revealed. We've known this for a while. We've taught on it for a while, but we've been able to add new nuggets, more revelation to reveal the, the entire picture from one verse and three key words in it awesome all right guys you ready you ready you ready ready because if you guys recall this from the 21st into the 22nd of june of 2024 from the 15th to the 16th i guess you'd call it the 16th of savan is the beginning of the seven sabbath count of the feast of weeks we have proven it and i'm going to show it to you here right now okay where are we today we are now at the end of the first sabbath i was going to say earlier i was i had a little note i was going to say oh we've got six weeks left well no not technically it's a little bit more than six weeks right because it's sabbaths now, when I say that, it's only like two days more. But we have six Sabbaths left to go, brothers and sisters. This was the first Sabbath week. We are one down, brothers and sisters. Six to go has now begun. Has now begun. So where did it start? Right here. Which means, as we have shown and as we've explained, the weed harvest every year happens anywhere from late May to mid-late June in any given year. We know which wheat harvest it is. It is the winter wheat harvest because winter wheat is planted in the fall, go, grows a bit and remains dormant through winter, starts growing up in spring, and is harvested in summer. It could be very late spring, but its main portion is through summer once the sickle is put to it and biblically that happens on the 16th of savan yep 
It's the 16th of Savan every single year. Most people haven't understood that because they say, well, wait a second, shouldn't we be counting from the 16th of Nisan? No, nope. and we're not going to go into, we've talked about this many times, especially even more so lately. When you realize that the calendars are off by two months and where God created everything and when he gave the law, this was the beginning. This was month one, because in our modern day, Savan is the month of Taurus. You know, some people say, they'll say, no, no, Taurus is, is back here. It's, it's in May, and it would be connected then to the Hebrew month of Ayar. Nope. And you know why? Because the, those people that talk about, um, you know, the constellations with, uh, um, what do you call that? Uh, 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 um astronomy ast astrology so those that that look at it and say oh i was born in this month you know when they say that in relation to astrology astrology is one month behind because when that stuff was all created when they went and made all that stuff back like what over 2500 or so years ago right what was it with the greeks and the romans and so forth way back then they did it when the sun was one month off but now the sun is two months off. And all of these, you know, those, whatever you call those things again, they haven't adjusted. And so people will say, oh, I'm really, this is Taurus right here, not over here. No, nope. Taurus is actually in the month of Savan and has been now, I don't know how long it's been, but it's been, you know, several hundred years at least. So we know that it's off by two months. We know when the Lord gave the law. We know when it was Enoch. We know in Moses' day. We know in Noah's day. And all these things, Taurus was month one. So we've been saying this now for a while, probably a couple of years, and really, really nailed it down in the past year. That's why we've had no real high watch. I mean, yes, we're always watching. We are always ready, no matter what. But the highest watch of all high watches of any given year now is going to be the time of the 8th of Av. But that means the count of the seven Sabbaths begins first. And it begins on the 16th of Savan every year in our day and age where the sun is off by two constellations. If that's true, that must mean that the wheat harvest has to have begun somewhere around mid is June in this year, 2024. Okay, watch this. I posted this. Those who are in the forum, uh, they saw me post this the other day. Check this out. Okay, this is a brand new short clip video. It's the 2024 Wheat Harvest Update with John. The Wheat Harvest 2024 underway. You want to know when this was done? Check this out. Here's the description. In this short video, we'll watch the team of Burn officially pick off Wheat Harvest 2024. When did they kick off this Wheat Harvest in 2024? On the 21st of June. You want to talk about being right on target? Now, I didn't just pick this video. I watched a number of videos, and they all started within this time frame right here. They were all within about a week, give or take, of having started. The second video I saw was that one, and it began right here. On the date. You realize, because we talk on a Hebrew calendar, we're talking Jewish time, right? From Jerusalem, which would be the same as saying the 16th. So, what do we get? Right on target. The actual wheat harvest began on the 21st to the 22nd of June of 2024, right on target. I was so excited when I saw that. I just thought, you know, let me go see if, uh, if the wheat harvest has started. Because you have to understand, guys, we know that there are two wheat harvests, winter wheat and spring wheat. It's literally impossible for this to be spring wheat. And that's why it's not. This is the winter wheat harvest. Let me show you now, for those of you, you guys know this, 
But let me remind you guys how this plays out. In Deuteronomy chapter 16, starting in verse 9, seven weeks, okay, the seven weeks of Sabbath, shall thou number unto thee, begin to number the seven weeks from such time as thou begin to put the sickle to the corn, which means wheat, because the feast of weeks is to the wheat harvest, the winter wheat harvest, okay? It's the feast of weeks, which is wheat, and it is to winter wheat. So you can't start counting the seven Sabbaths until you begin to put the sickle to the wheat. When was the sickle put to the wheat? Boom. Right on target. Right on time. Now, what do we know about this? About this Feast of Weeks count? Let's go over here. Let's go to our trusted e-sword. Let's go to Numbers chapter 28 and see what it says about what happens at the end of those seven weeks. Okay? Feast of Weeks. Numbers 28, 26. Also, in the day of the first fruits, when you begin, not first fruits as in the Feast of First Fruits, this is the first fruits of the crop from the Feast of Weeks. Also, in the day of the first fruits, when you bring a new meat offering unto the Lord, listen to this, after your weeks be out. Isn't that awesome? You can't begin to start the Feast of Weeks count until you begin to cut down, till you begin to put the sickle to the wheat, and I have just shown you, it just started in mid-late June. And Scripture tells us that it takes seven Sabbaths. Seven Sabbaths, and when the seven Sabbaths, the seven weeks are out, it is August 12th. And when those seven Sabbaths are out, what happens? The first fruits go to the Lord. Pre-trib, brothers and sisters. Pre-trib. Then comes the 50 days of the portion that I was talking about earlier, if you knew, called above. That portion of above 14 years, which is 50 days, it begins at the end of the seventh Sabbath. So if this is the beginning of the 50 days, right here, Right at the end of the seventh Sabbath, that's your pre-trip. Jerusalem time. Right here, bang. Which means, depending what side of the world, pre-trip might happen somewhere back in here. Right as soon as it's over, pre-trip happens. I don't know what hour it happens, but I am absolutely convinced we have understood and been revealed the time. And guys, the harvest of the winter wheat, the sickle has been put to the wheat. Right on time. Let that sink in. Right on time. You see, we're not talking about spring wheat because spring wheat is sown in the spring and it's harvested in the fall. Remember, it's you could say late summer into early fall. Winter wheat is sown in the fall. It lives through winter and is harvest then is harvested in the summer. It starts in maybe late spring and then is harvested through summer. And this is what we're talking about. Winter wheat. For those that don't know, winter wheat is called old and spring wheat is called new. So what happens for the Jews is when spring wheat is harvested it's planted in the spring and it's harvested in that late summer, early fall time frame. Once they harvest it, it's called new wheat. So for them, they can't use it till Passover, day two of Passover, the following year. And once that day two of Passover, the following year comes, they then call it old wheat, which means they can now use it. Winter wheat, which is old wheat right away because it was planted in the fall before Passover, has no need when it's harvested to have any waiting period. When the seven Sabbaths are over, it can be crushed and used to make leavened loaves 
of bread. The Jews have all this twisted up too because they always stick with the spring wheat. They're always looking to Rachel instead of Leah. Yeah, you guys know the story. You guys know the story. Why? Because the prophetic picture of Leah and Rachel, Rachel uh, Leah is called the older, the elder, the, the old wheat typology, and Rachel is called the younger, as in the younger wheat. So what goes first? Leah. Leah is called the older, the elder. The older or elder goes before the younger. And this is a picture all the way back to creation. All the way back to creation. For those that don't know that, I'm not going to spend a lot of time except to give a couple little blurps on it. This goes all the way back to the story of creation. When we read in the beginning, which means Christ. Okay, The word beginning means Christ. Jesus is called what? The beginning and the end, the Aleph and the Tav. The word for beginning is Aleph. It's the first letter in the Hebrew alphabet, which is the ox, which is? Ding, 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 Taurus. You got it, Taurus. It was Taurus. So that means in Christ, God created heaven and earth. We share this regularly, right? We, we read it in the New Testament. All things were created in Christ, right? All was given to Christ to create by the Father. Christ is the word beginning. And that word beginning is first fruits. Not as in first fruits of the Feast of Weeks. He is the first fruits of the uh, Feast of First Fruits. And in creation it was in Taurus. And it was the 16th day of Savan in Taurus. And in the end being like the beginning, whoever finds the beginning finds the end. For in the beginning there the end will be. As the, as the Apocryphal Book of Thomas says, there it is, the beginning of the end count. In Taurus, the beginning. <clears throat> so if this is the count to the Feast of Weeks of Winter Wheat, which is the Leah, the older who goes first, then the count is on. The count has begun. Leah's, Leah's uh, um, being harvested right now. <clears throat> the... The older, the, the firstborn, right? Obviously, if there's an older and there's a younger, the elder is called what? The firstborn. Who were the firstborns of creation? Those of the spirit. The gap theory that we've taught on and talked about over the years. The first two verses of Genesis are called the gap theory. They, they, they realized over centuries that something happened in Genesis 1 and 2 before the light came. Some would say this accounts for the billions of years of all of these other... No, it's not billions of years. Just like these were the days of creation, and they would have seemed like a thousand years each if we were there in time. Just like we are now from Adam in the thousands of years in time. But to God, they're like days. So seven days and 7,000, which to us would have been 7,000 and 7,000. But to God, there's seven days and seven days. Wait, that sounds familiar, right? The end of days is seven years and seven years. It's awesome how that happens, right? Well, this gap theory is no different. It's the mystery. It's the beginning of creation, and in this beginning, when Christ created this all, what was it? It was spirit. It was the spirit of God that moved over the waters, right? O upon the face of the waters. The light didn't come till the creation of days in verse 3, when Jesus became light. <laughs> People that are new would be saying, what are you talking about? This isn't Jesus. Yeah, it is. Of course, this is Jesus. He was the beginning when God gave it all. The father gave it all to Jesus, who is God, the son. God, the father gave it all to him to go and create. And the first portion was spirit. So those who were with Christ in the spirit. In Christ, in the spirit. The next portion that came was the light. 
It wasn't the sun and the moon. The sun and the moon hadn't been created yet. So who was this light? What was this light? Of course, it was Christ. We know that from John chapter 1. That's when the portion of light came. So in the beginning was the word. The word was the uh, word was God. The word was with God, right? Because Jesus is God and he was with God, the father. And then what? Then the word became then he became light. John became John bear witness of that light that John wasn't that light, but he bore witness of the light. What was the light? Verse three of Genesis when Christ went from spirit, not that he was created, but he went from spirit and all the creation that he created in the spirit. And then the father made him light. So he was now a spirit and light being. And the days of creation then began. And then you get to Genesis chapter two and it starts the flesh. There was spirit, light, flesh. It's so incredible. And, and when you go to the um, to the playlist on the website, the intro series. And you've studied through those things. When you get to the last video, we go into great detail about all of this. It's called It's All a Fractal. Spirit, light, flesh, spirit, light, flesh, uh, right? The, the spirit, the son, the father, uh, uh, pre, mid, post, Luke, Mark, Matthew, uh, 21,000 years, 21 years for the end of days. And with the new beginning being the 22nd, I mean, it's so impactful it's so awesome it's just so wild so what do we know from this remember we're talking about this older and younger leah and rachel so leah is the older leah is the firstborn rachel is the younger so her portion will be later and that's why her portion is a typology of the mid-trib we're talking about the pre-trib those who are what part of the beginning the older you see the older goes before the younger and this is the portion of the older of those who are what in the beginning meaning in christ and spirit so you could say in christ spirit filled well that starts to sound familiar doesn't it when we go to romans chapter 8 we read that exact same thing in romans chapter 8 it says there is therefore now no condemnation to those to them that are in Christ who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. No condemnation for those who are what? In Christ. Spirit filled. And it goes on to talk about all this, right? It goes on to talk about it, talk about it, talk about it all over. Um, then we get to the great part that we've talked on many times with uh, verse 14. For as many as are led by the spirit of god what did genesis 1 say the spirit of god moved upon the faces of the face of the waters spirit of god for as many as are led by the spirit of god who are the ones led by the spirit of god the ones who are in christ who are the ones who are in christ led by the spirit in the beginning those who were the firstborn of creation so the, the typology of the Luke group, the typology of the Leah, the uh, same connection to the Luke, the, the same connection to those going pre-trib are called the older, like the older wheat, like the winter wheat that are a part of the Feast of Weeks and they go first because they are the older, the firstborn. That's what the story is all about. That's why it says led by the Spirit of God they are the sons of god for you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear but you have received the spirit of adoption whereby we cry abba father the spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of god and if children then heirs heirs of god and joint heirs with christ that always blows me away could you imagine being called joint heir with christ craziness if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be glorified together. Awesome, awesome stuff. This is what's waiting for us, guys. Those who are in Christ, spirit-filled, seeking, searching him diligently. You know that new term that I used in a recent video? enoch We're about to be enoch out of here. We can't take it for granted, though. Don't ever think you can take it for granted.
That's why we have to be watching and praying always. Not just think, oh, we're good and off we go back to doing whatever we want. Yes, we have to live our lives. Yes, we have to do things to 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 get along and do the things that need to be done in this life. But within it, we have to spend time with them daily with him, giving him thanks in prayer, seeking, spending some time with him in his word to get to know him. Right. And that's what these teachings do, especially for those that are prophetically, diligently seeking and searching. It lights that fire. It, it gives us that water for those who are thirsty. Right. That's what happens, because when you begin to understand it, you just dig in more and more and more. It's awesome, awesome stuff. So as we're seeing that the Leah is the one that is connected to the winter wheat, that is connected to the feast of weeks, which, as you know, Leah is the one that gets married. And we know the old fulfill her week. Now, here's the thing. The Feast of Weeks isn't one week long. The Feast of Weeks is only a single day. But the wedding is one week long. So when the seven Sabbaths are over, it ends right here. Right? It's the 8th of Av, Jerusalem time, from the 11th into the 12th. And it's when it's over, as soon as that seventh Sabbath is over. Then what happens? The pre-trib will happen and you've got the seven-day wedding in heaven. You see, because just like Leah fulfilled her week, and her, her week is represented as the Feast of Weeks, but the Feast of Weeks isn't seven days. It's only one day. It's only one. But there's a seven-day wedding. And that's why this seven-day celebration of the pre-trib wedding, the seventh day is what? The 15th of Av to be Av. You can probably even really say that this, this would be your Feast of Weeks wedding time frame. But the pre-trib happens right here. That's your seven days right there. And it's the seventh day that I believe is probably going to be the wedding, which would be the 15th of Av. But is it like a, a whole week? Yeah, we know it's a week. But we also know the Feast of Weeks is only a single day. And it's most likely the 15th of that month, which would be, in this case, the 15th of Av, when you understand the harvest counts and the calendar of the sun having been off by two months. It's all right there, guys. It's right in our faces now. It's in our faces. So again, Leah, winter wheat, older, just like the winter wheat is called the older, um, older being firstborn and firstborn being connected to those who are part of the same typology of the beginning of creation which means they are in christ and spirit filled who will be the sons of god it doesn't get any more clear they're the ones who go first that is the pre-trib bride of christ so when we come to the story now of second corinthians chapter 12 which we have shown and broken down now for almost seven years of the revelation of 14 years and above. It's the typology of Paul from 2 Corinthians chapter 12 when he says, I knew a man in Christ. There's that in Christ. Above, which we can prove and have shown it's the 50 days, 14 years. What happens to this first group in Christ? What happens to this Leah winter wheat group that are the firstborns in that, that spirit portion of creation in the same typology? Well, theirs is like a rapture, and they're going to the third heaven. Then we see there's a second one. And look at what this one says. I knew such a man. This is such a big, big deal. You know, people say, oh, this is just Paul referencing himself in these, in these events over 14 years and change. Well, of course, that is, that's your vision of looking through things that have taken place in the is. But in the is to come, looking into these words and focusing on what the words individually are saying, this one is, I knew a man in Christ, and this one is, I knew such a man. 
So that'd be like Paul saying, yeah, I was in Christ, and then, well, I wasn't really in Christ, but I, you know, kind of. Well, that didn't happen with Paul. There was prophetic, these are little prophetic clues within this for us. This is your Leia. Older, going first, above 14 years. It's going to be like a rapture, and they're going to be caught up into the third heaven. Then I knew such a man, okay, not in Christ like the first one, but, you know, loves the Lord, you know, but not like really like the first one in Christ. This is the mid-trib, was caught up going to paradise. So what do we have here? We have a taking, and then the mid-trib great multitude is another taking. Both of these are connected to the kingdom of God. And then... Now he's saying the third time, he says, I am ready to come to you. And you're going to notice this theme always. A taking, a taking, and a return. Pre-trib is a taking to the third heaven, kingdom of God. Mid-trib is a, is, uh, uh, is a taking um, uh, to the kingdom of God. And the post-trib is a return with the kingdom of heaven. The first two go to the kingdom of God. One is in the third heaven, and one is into the paradise portion of the kingdom of God. It's awesome. So, how does this all connect in relation to this timing count? Because I want you guys to understand, because where we're going into with the, um, with the transfiguration, understanding and following these numbers along is, a, is very important. So, how many numbers do you have in the Hebrew alphabet? For those who don't know, it's purposed. It is 100% unequivocally purposed for its numbers. 8, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22. Aleph and Tav, beginning and end. What is Aleph? Taurus. Where did the count begin? Taurus, right? As we shared earlier. It's 22 letters long. That's important to understand because you're going to see this when we get into the transfiguration story. And what do we know? This principle in the prophetic, right? The day-year principle or year-for-a-day principle is a method of interpretation of Bible prophecy in which a word, day, in prophecy is considered to be a symbolic year of actual time. Okay? So it, it's the same thing when it comes to the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet, there's 22 letters. It could be seen as 22 days. Do you know how it could be seen as 22 days? Only to the Father and Son. Only to being up there in the third heaven. To the Father, what happens? A thousand days, right? Uh, um, what is it? A thousand years is as one day. So, if... We have, in the beginning, Aleph, and we only have two verses, and people think there was some sort of creation that took place before verse 3 of Genesis 1. What is going on in there? Well, what we've been able to prove is that it's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 days of creation that were taking place in that time, which... If we were there in time and looking at it through our fleshly time, it would have been like 7,000 years. But it's kind of a mystery because there's only two verses. <laughs> there's only two verses to discern this. But we have a clue. We have a clue, right? Because Genesis 29, when, when Jacob went to work for uh, Laban, his father-in-law, when he fulfilled those first seven years, he said he was so excited because he was so in love for her in Genesis 29, 20, that they seemed unto him but a few days. They seemed like a few days. But what did he fulfill? What did he actually do? He fulfilled, he worked seven years expecting to get Rachel but got Leah. But to him, they felt like days. And so what do we get in the creation story? 
we get two verses. That is the spirit portion in Christ and the spirit hovering over the waters. Yet, nobody knows how long that creation portion is. I've submitted for a long time now that it's seven days to the Lord. If we were there in the physical time that we are in now, it would have seemed like 7,000 years. And the day-to-year principle is Jacob having worked seven years, but they flew by like days. And then what happened? Then he worked seven more. So the eighth year is now one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So he now worked 14 years, right? And he got he got Rachel, but he had to serve those 14 years for her. I mean, those seven years for her. So in total, we know that he served seven and seven for a total of 14 years. And then what? Then he served one, two, three, four, five, six years with his father-in-law for the cattle. And when that sixth year or that 20th year was done, he made a covenant with his father-in-law after the 20th. So at the start of that 21st year, he made a covenant with his father-in-law. And the 22nd is that picture of gone off and new beginning. Seven, 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 and then the new beginning of 22. In Jacob's story, it's seven, seven, six. But that seventh year is that year of the covenant. Okay, that when that seventh, that sixth year was over, that 20th year was over, he makes that covenant with his father-in-law. They, they settle things, and then you have what? Then you have a new beginning, the 22nd year. It's the story from creation all the way through even revealing the end of days. And what I mean by that, for those that hadn't seen it, I believe it began on September 17th on the Revelation 12 sign, began the seven years as the Leah being prepared by the Spirit. The winter wheat, the older, the Spirit filled in Christ being prepared to be taken out in the 50 days that remain of the 14 of the of the first seventh year right those seven easy years there's an above portion of 50 days where she goes first and then when it's over what happens then you've got the 14 years where he's got seven more years which is connected to Rachel and Rachel is as we know, connected to spring wheat harvested in the fall, right? Late summer, early fall, but won't be observed until Passover or second Passover of the following year. It's awesome. And then, of course, you've got the seven more years. So what do we have? We have the picture of the end of days being seven easy, seven of seals, seven of trumpets, and the final jubilee year, the 22nd year. You see that? Seven, 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 one, 22. Now, this part, the seven easy that we've been in before this pre-trib happens, it doesn't really seem like anything, right? Nobody's really aware of anything that's taking place, except for the people that have been waking up since 2017. Things have been changing, right? We can attest to that here. So our focus isn't really so much in this as it has been preparing and waking people up and sharing revelation and reaching whoever we can so that they could be ready to be accounted worthy so they don't have to be a part of this. So when we talk about 14 years and then the 15th year, it's really the same as talking about the 21 and 22nd year. But the real tribulation portion of it is the seven and seven and then jubilee being the 15th year just like the creation story you see the creation story doesn't really have this seven days or seven thousand years really mentioned much in it it only talks about what the portion that's like 
days like Jacob. They were seven years, but they flew by like days. There was a, a seven day or 7,000 creation in the gap theory of verse one and two, but the Lord was so excited in his creation, it's just, it's a little blurb of info. But the truth of it is it's a seven. It's a seven day creation portion in the spirit. That's what's really going on. And the revelation of the end of days shows this all to be true. And the portion that goes first is the winter wheat. Because the winter wheat is the older that goes before the younger. So you want to see how that plays out? Watch this. Again, in Deuteronomy 16, in this day to year, I'll just go through this briefly. I know you guys have seen this before. We've talked about it, but I love this. I love this revelation in Deuteronomy 16 where three times a year they're to appear before the Lord. It is so perfect. It is so absolutely connected to creation and the end of days that whenever I ponder it, and I was talking about it with my wife yesterday as well or the day before, I just, I get so, like I, I just, I start going down and I'm explaining, I'm explaining because it is so incredibly powerful so awe-inspiring when you see it because it is the revelation of the end of days everybody thinks because feast uh, um because the passover the week of unleavened bread comes first that it must be the first thing but it's not because we have proven the older is leah the older is the feast of weeks that goes first the younger is rachel and she is connected to the new that has to wait until the time of mid-trip and then when the great multitude comes in at the time of Passover, which is in the midst of the seventh year of seals, is the relation to the unleavened bread of affliction. And then, of course, that tabernacles or... or um. You know, Feast of Tabernacles, or what do they call it? Uh, uh, anyways, Feast of Tabernacles is the other one that is seven days and then has an eighth day. So what do we know about this? Well, we know, as we shared earlier, seven weeks, and then you have your Feast of Weeks. So you begin to count your weeks when you put the sickle to the corn, which is the wheat. And when your seven weeks are out, bang, then they come in. That's when you bring it to the Lord. That's the pre-trib Leah. But then remember what it says about the one for Passover for the week of unleavened bread. It's seven days of unleavened bread, even the bread of affliction. How does it play out, though? It's six days as what? Six years. Remember, a day is a year, just like the whole creation or creations. So you've got six days as the six years of seals. And on the seventh is the solemn assembly to the Lord. Well, that's exactly the revelation of seals. It's six days or six years of seals, and on the seventh day or in the seventh year of seals is the great multitude rapture. There is no more judgment taking place in the midst of the seventh year of seals. It's over after the sixth. And when it's over after the sixth, the Lord is dealing with things and and things are getting set straight and so forth in that seventh year. So that's why you've got six days or six years and then the seventh. But when that seventh is over, then what do you have? Well, then you've got the days of tabernacles. So you've got seven days as the seven years of tabernacles. So this is your seven years of unleavened bread, but... At the end of the sixth year, the Lord is seen coming on heavenly Mount Zion. And then this is your seventh year. He's on Mount Zion. He's defeated the enemies at the end of the sixth. And what do we see? There he is. Seals the, the, the 144. The great multitude happens. There, there is no judgment in that seventh year. It was over after six. Then what do you have with tabernacles? Tabernacles, you've got seven days of tabernacles. And we've got what? Seven years now of trumpet judgments. But the seven days of tabernacles 
What do we know about the seven days of tabernacles? It's seven days and then the eighth day. So we come to Leviticus 23 and we see seven days you shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. On the eighth day shall be a holy convocation unto you. It is a solemn assembly. So you've got seven days, but the solemn assembly isn't until the eighth. Why does this matter? Because the days as years prophecy principle is there's your seven days as seven years. But the solemn assembly isn't until the eighth day, which is what the what is the eighth day called in, in tabernacles? The eighth day, Shmini Aretz, is called New Beginning. Because the new beginning will be the Jubilee. But why is it seven? If this was seven, but the sixth is the assembly, why is tabernacle set up as seven and then the eighth is the assembly? Because when the Lord returns, feet down on the Mount of Olives to begin the 14th year or the seventh year of trumpet judgments, this final year is the day of the Lord called the year of his vengeance. This is when he destroys all the enemies. Satan is bound. Uh, um, it, it's the treading of the grapes with the wine press of the wrath of God. That's why those in Revelation chapter 12, verse 14, at mid trumpet judgments, are taken to the wilderness on the wings of an eagle, not just for two and a half years, but till the end of the 14th year. They won't just be hiding out for here. They're going to go right to the end of the 14th year of tribulation or even right to the end of the seventh trumpet judgment of the seventh year of tabernacles. So they're going to be brought back at the Jubilee. So it can't be the same because judgment is over at this point here and he is here doing his things for, for the ceiling and the great multitude and everything else, whereas over here, it's his final year judgment as the days of Noah. And then it's the assembly when they will be brought back from the wilderness and it's the Jubilee and they're given their division of lands and everything else. Those story is there. It's literally there for us. It's in the beginning of creation. It's in the three feasts when they're to appear before the Lord. It's in the, the revelation of the years from Jacob. It's connected with Leah and Rachel. It's all over the place. It's so awesome. So what you're going to see now is knowing that there is a seven year that comes first, but it's something that flew by like days or that it's mysterious and that we're only told it's 14 years and above, which is this 50 day portion or creation only gave us two verses for this mystery period of time in the beginning, everything, which is part of what came first, right? The firstborn, the, the, the beginning, the oldest. The oldest are those in Christ's spirit filled. So when we see this and you know that it's the pre-trib Luke, it's the mid-trib Mark, great multitude rapture, and that it's the post-trib feet down of the Lord, You've got your pre, you've got your mid, and you've got your post. Which means you can show that the picture, and you're going to be able to see this, that the picture really is a seven that came first before the 14. And what are all these sevens? For those that don't know this, all of these sevens are like right here. There's one, two, three. Four, five, six, seven. So when we talk about the 22nd year, or once the end begins, and we're talking about it being 15 years, it's also the exact same thing as saying the 50th year jubilee. It's just that all these years aren't part of the prophetic picture. The seven easy are somewhat a part of it. They're built into it very mysteriously, but they are absolutely part of the picture. But then the end of days is really about this final above portion, which is the 50 days before the seven years of seals 
and the seven years of trumpets before the final jubilee. This is all about the seven times seven years and then the jubilee. So let's see how this plays out as we continue to take this forward and we go into Luke chapter 9. So in Luke chapter 9, we're going to go up to some of these other things as well back here. But I want to start by focusing on this storyline that I've been laying out for you to understand these years to days, days to years typology, okay, or, or understanding. So we see here something fantastic in Luke chapter 9. And in fact, we'll start in 27, and then we're going to go into Mark, and then we're going to go into Matthew, and then we'll come back to Luke, and we'll cover some of these things, going right from the beginning of Luke chapter 9. And then Mark, and then Matthew again, in these differences. But this was, this was such a beautiful piece of revelation when we got it a few years ago. I mean, we've had so many exciting ones over the year. I love rehashing some of them because when you put it all together and you lay it all out, it just, ah, it just, it, it feels good. It feels nice. It feels uplifting. It feels strengthening and encouraging. Because when you see what the words are saying and you understand what's just been laid out and being able to track and count and, and see all these things, whether days, whether years, whether thousands, it's all there, right into the Gospels. So in Luke 9, 27, he says, But I tell you of a truth, there be some standing here which shall not taste of death. Okay, remember when I talk about enoch out of here? This is the group that will be enoch out of here. Standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the kingdom of God. You know what that means? That's the next thing you're going to see. They, they're, they won't have seen it coming. They're not going to experience this or that first. Bang. The next thing the Enoch group people will see, those that are the Leah types, the in Christ, spirit filled, the older, the winter wheat, that group that is going to experience this, the very next thing they're going to see is the kingdom of God. And now look what Luke 9, 28 says. Now, how can I know this? If you're new to the ministry, just keep following as I continue going forward because you're going to understand these differences I was, as I was talking about earlier between Luke, Mark, and Matthew in this revelation. So Matthew, Mark, Luke is how the Gospels are laid out in the Synoptic Gospels, but we're told the first will be last and the last will be first. Matthew, Mark, Luke in the end of days is Luke, Mark, Matthew. The older before the younger, okay? So what do we see? It says in verse 28, 928, the transfiguration story begins. It says, and it came to pass about an eight days, listen to this, after these sayings. Wait a second. It came to pass about, not, not after eight days, not, not, you know, eight days, uh, about so around the eighth day so if you look at it in our chart and you know we've got the big picture of 21 to 22 years which is the alphabet and, and the creation of the alphabet and so forth and you've got seven 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 and then one that would mean it's something like being what it the seventh right what does it say it's a, a, about an eighth day so it could still be somewhere around the late portion of whoops the late portion of the seven not quite the eighth otherwise it would have said the eighth day right it would have said the eighth day it would have been after eight days or you know what i mean that type of thing or after seven it's telling us in this prophetic picture here that it's about the end time frame of the seventh day or seventh year. Days as years, right? Well, what do we know about the end of the seventh year? There's 50 days. 50, 
fe true feast of weeks and then 50 days. What happens? Pre-trip. Those who will not taste of death. What happens in those 50 days? The pre-trip happens. The seven-day wedding takes place. And the Lord returns what? He returns to begin his 40 days as, as, you got it, the white horse rider. He returns to begin his 40 days as the white horse rider about an eighth day when he returns from the wedding. Notice this is why we get this strange thing. After these sayings, it came to pass about an eight days after these sayings. So what it was it a picture of? Not only is it a picture of the days as years, as it being almost the end of seven years, about an eighth year, but it's also a prophetic type of the Lord coming about an eight days after the pre-trib wedding that had taken place. So here's the pre-trib, and then you've got the 50 days beginning, right? That end at Elul 29. And in these 50 days, the pre-trib happens. There's your seven-day wedding, and the Lord is coming what? About an eight days later. So not only is it prophetically saying it's almost the eighth year, which would be the first year of the 14 that's left, but it's also saying it's the eighth day of when the Lord is coming after the wedding. And that's how we're able to show that the transfiguration, that's one of the ways that we were able to prove this picture of the transfiguration and him coming on the eighth day is him coming when he returns from the wedding. But we're going to get more insight when we come back to this because Luke's own, is the only one that says after these things. So it came to pass about an eight days after these things. What sayings? These sayings. In Luke's layout of the transfiguration and the words that come before the transfiguration, there are 27 verses of information of, of Scripture that comes before Luke's transfiguration. And that's why you get this after these sayings laid out the way it is. You're going to see. Remember, it's like the it's like this revelation we did in the what surrounded the mustard seed in Luke, Mark, and Matthew. It's the same type of thing. And our focus, even though we'll touch on some of these things after, our focus is going to be on what comes before it. You'll see what I'm saying. So now look what happens at Mark's transfiguration. In Mark's transfiguration, in Mark chapter 9, verse 2, oh, you see where it started? In verse 2. Why, why would Luke's be laid out with 27 verses of detail that come before the transfiguration? Yet Mark's is laid out with only one verse. These are wild details, guys. When you see what this all means... It's no different than what I was talking about with the mustard seed in that video. But it's, it's similar, but a little bit different in the sense of what's being said before it and why those things are all laid out in the chapter the way they are, where in the other ones they're not. You want to talk about level of layers between, or levels layers of level deep that this brings into the revelation of all of these things? It's crazy. It's so wild that we can prove the the uh, the differences are on purpose. We can prove um, chapters and verses were spirit led on purpose. We can prove how the the chapters were divided and where events were laid out differently from one gospel to the other was led on purpose. Every single one of these things we are able to prove and it builds on the revelation of Christ showing that all of these things were purposed and led being done by the Spirit. 
Do you think all of those those men that had, had divided the chapters and the verses and came to an agreement, do you think they, they were sitting there in a room and, and the spirit flowed through and tongues of fire and they didn't? No. They prayed over it. They prayed over it. They sought the Lord. They were in agreement with each other when they did these things. But the spirit was working through them. And we've been proving it for almost seven years. And this is just another layer of detail about it. So look at what we read now in Mark, starting in verse 1. And he said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that there be some of them that stand here which shall not taste of death till they have seen, past tense, the kingdom of God come with power. You see that? Mark, Luke and Mark both have the kingdom of God. Luke's is the next thing you're going to see. Bang, is the kingdom of God. Mark's, it says, you will have seen the kingdom of God come. That's not the same. You will have seen it come. This is him speaking to the mid-trib great multitude rapture. And I'm going to even show why this one verse is in verse 1 before verse 2 transfiguration story. It's so perfect. It's awesome. But we'll get to that in a bit. So, remember what we saw in Luke. Just, just almost the seventh is all done. It's about an eighth day as year, but in Luke's it also represents the eighth day of the coming of the Lord, the about an eighth day when he comes to begin his 40 days of the white horse rider. In Mark 9, verse 2, look at what we read here. And after six days... After six days. So now, once the tribulation has started, and we're saying after six days, there's your years. Six days as six years, which means the Lord is coming what? After six days, or after six years, the Lord is coming on in, in 2030, feet down, on the... Uh, sorry, uh, uh, not feet down. Um, in the seventh year of seals, the Lord will then come on heavenly Mount Zion on the day and hour no one knows in 2030 as the seventh year of seals, which is what? Six days of unleavened bread. And the seventh day, right? On the seventh day is the solemn assembly. And we know the events that will take place, which is the sealing of the 144 and so on and so forth, right? The 144, right? The Whether you want to say whether the tribes of Levi or so forth, it's that, that priestly line, the 144, that will be with the Lamb, follow him wheresoever he goes, sealed with the Father's name. Okay? The 144 is sealed first, and then in the midst of the year, you have then the great multitude rapture, which is the spring wheat, which was ready on the day and hour no one knows. Right at the Feast of Trumpets 2030, which is exactly what Mark's discourse says when he comes on the day and hour no one knows. And the 144 are sealed. But then what do we know? Well, we know because of the spring wheat and its connection to unleavened bread that their portion would be either first Passover or more than likely, because first Passover was fulfilled by the Lord, that this group would be then the complete full rapture of the great multitude would be in 2031 at the um, uh, second Passover in unleavened bread. Right there in order. Six days as six years. Exactly as it's revealing to us in these typologies. Days as years. Now watch what happens when we go to Matthew. Matthew starts in chapter 17. Wait a second. Matthew's transfiguration starts right off the bat in verse 1. And what does it start off with saying? After six days. Why is Matthew's after six days? Matthew's is after six days because then when this final seventh year, which is the seventh day, of unleavened bread is over, you now have 
the seven days as seven years of tabernacles. But that said, after six days, which is the six years of trumpet judgments, and then what do we know happens? The Lord comes, feet down on the Mount of Olives, on the day and hour no one knows, just like Matthew's discourse says, and then we're told it would be as it was in the days of Noah. And we know this is when he brings destruction and devastation upon all of his enemies, upon all the earth. It's the day of the Lord that is the year of his vengeance. So what do you have? Seven days. The Lord comes on the seventh. So you've got the after six. He's here as the seventh day of tabernacles, but they're not being brought back yet. It's not the assembly day yet. It's not till after that final day of the Lord, which is the year of his wrath. Wait a second, what? The day of the Lord, which is the year of his vengeance? The day is a year? Huh. <laughs> All perfectly in line. And it's the seventh as tabernacles. So that when it's over, it'll be the new beginning. It'll be the end, the tav. It's over. It'll have been the picture of 777 seven, seven, and 1, 22, played out as the three feasts of the Lord when there are to appear before him. You see how that works? It's absolutely incredible. And now we're going to go back into Luke, and we're going to see some of these details as to why there's this, this detail, a lot of detail in Luke's, one verse in Mark's, and none in Matthew's. All of it, all of it, all of it, all of it is purposed. So in Luke chapter 9, verse 1, it starts off right off the bat by letting us know. It says, look at this, even how they titled it for us in the King James. Jesus sends out the 12 apostles. <laughs> You know, that couldn't be any more clear for us in the Revelation, could it? It says in verse 1, Then he called his 12 disciples, but we know this one is relation to the 12 apostles, right? Together and gave them power and authority over all devils and to cure all diseases. And he sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. Don't we know something about this? Haven't we revealed exactly what this is remember when the pre-trib happens do you know based on what was just said here based on what was just said here the pre-trib happened sometime shortly before this prophetic typology plays out you guys will remember this from chapter uh john chapter 20 remember this John chapter 20, we've got the prophetic typology here with Mary Magdalene. Go and tell the disciples, I have not yet ascended to the Father, all of that. That is the prophetic picture here, that typology of the pre-trib. And then what happens? This is a picture of the Lord taking the pre-trib in John chapter 20, verse 17, 18. And then what does it say? Then the same day at evening. Which, if we go to... The, uh, is it on this calendar? Oh, yeah. Which, if we go to the pre-trib, this is where the pre-trib will have happened. And then what does he do? Right here. He's returning in the evening portion at the very beginning of the 50. The pre-trib was just taken, and he's now returning, <coughs> excuse me, which is right at the beginning of the 50 days. And what is he doing? He's meeting with the apostles. Remember what he does to them? In verse tw John 20, verse 21, Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you, as my Father has sent me, even so I send, uh, send I you. And when he said this, he breathed on them and said unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Whosoever sins you remit, they are remitted unto them. And whosoever sins you retain, they are retained. Remember this? We've taught on this many times. This is the Son of Man 
when he comes to be to take the pre-trib bride out, he returns the same day at evening, and he's going to breathe on whoever these new modern-day apostles will be. Whether it's breathe, whether it's something similar, they will receive the anointing of the Holy Ghost to do what? To go out and do the work of the Lord that he commanded them to do during what? The wedding week. During the wedding week. Now, they're going to continue with this power, and they're going to remain during seals. But if you remember, theirs is the prophetic typology of the of the minas, right? The, is it the talons or the minas in relation to the story of the coins and how many he gives to each one and so forth? This is, this is them going out during the week with that authority. So when we go back to Luke chapter 9, we know that this is the beginning of what? This is the beginning of the 50 days after the pre-trib has already been taken to the third heaven. And now he has returned and given them power and authority. And they're to go out during this one week wedding as he had, author as he had already uh, told them that they would do. This is exactly tied into um, the, the seven churches that we revealed. When we show that when Ephesus starts over again, it's the apostolic age that will begin because the pre-trib is taken. Remember, this is Ephesus represents the beginning of the 50 days. And what does the Lord do? He breathes on the apostles. The apostolic age will begin again because tens of millions of people will have vanished. And where are they gone to? They're gone to the wedding of the Lord. His espousals, right? The, the day of his espousals. It's the wedding week. And the apostles have been anointed to go out and do that work during the wedding week before he returns on the eighth day and then ends up meeting with the Smyrna group. This is exactly what we're seeing, which is why we saw down here in verse 28, he says, after these sayings. Do you know that you, you look at, um, uh, at what Mark said, there was one verse. There was no need to say after these sayings. It doesn't say it in Matthew because there was no after these sayings based on the layout of the chapter. And so when we go back and see this, we could see this is when he is breathing, when he anoints the apostles at the beginning of the wedding week. Now listen what happens. We follow this through and we come to Luke 9 verse 7. These guys were out preaching, right? They're healing everywhere. It's quite amazing what they're doing. Because these guys are going to have that that incredible. This isn't Acts 2.0, by the way. These whoever these modern day apostles will be, whether they're 12 or a larger number, I don't know. I believe they will be 12. But the anointing that they're going to get is going to be even more powerful than it was when the first apostles like these guys got it back then. Just like when the 50 days comes to an end and the disciple group. The remnant Smyrna workers get the anointing of the Holy Ghost. It won't be to the same extent to, to, of, of authority that maybe the, that the apostles have. But it will be even greater than those of Acts chapter 2 when they got it 2,000 years ago. Because the, the events that are going to come, the, the craziness that's going to break out on the earth, the power and the authority that's going to be needed is going to be far beyond what they ever experienced. So now look what happens next. We come into Luke 9, 7, and look at what we see. Now Herod the Tetrarch heard all that was done by him, and he was perplexed. This word perplexed is used five times in Scripture. It's only used twice in the Gospels. The two times it's used in the Gospels is right here in Luke 9, 7, but it's also in Luke 9, uh, uh, 24. And why is it important in Luke 24? In verse 4. And it came to pass as they were much perplexed. Thereabout, behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. So remember, in the midst of this typology of that the Lord being gone for those seven and coming back on the eighth day, the Lord was gone. The perplexing comes in the fact that the Lord was gone. In Luke 9, 
what is the perplexed that the world is going to have in the same typology of the perplexed from Luke 24? It's the vanishing. It's the vanishing. We showed the same typology in Exit in uh, Second Esdras, in chapter thirteen, verse twenty-nine, when it says, "Behold, the days are coming when the Most High will deliver those who are on the earth." This is the pre-trip, and bewilderment of mine shall come over all those who dwell on the earth. This is the perplexed. the The synonymous word with bewilderment is perplexed. It's the same word. These are the things that are happening in the midst of this week while the world is perplexed and the apostles have received this anointing. Well, if this is the case and this is the picture being laid out, what do you think we should also see? Maybe some sort of feast happening, right? It says in the apostles, when they returned and told them, <coughs> excuse me, all that they had done, he had took them aside privately into a desert place that's pretty interesting too but we'll leave that aside belonging to the city belonging to the city called bethsaida and the people when they knew it followed him and he received them and spake unto them of the kingdom of god and healed them that had need of healing so you see this whole stuff about healing you know when we talk about the the disciples and maybe the apostles and those who are going to be chosen to remain and serve the Lord. The, the remnant bride workers that we talk about, they will absolutely be healed. So any ailments, any issues that we might have, they will be healed. Of course they're going to be healed. How on earth are you supposed to make it through any portion of seals with a busted leg or a bad back or, or an ear imbalance or whatever it might be? We will be healed to endure because we're going out to serve him. Right? Now look what happens in Luke 9, verse 13. So that means, remember, all of these events from verse 1 through 27 to 28 are all in relation to the events taking place from the moment of the pre-trib to when he comes on the about an eighth day to start his 40 days as the Son of Man. And we saw him anointing the apostles. We see them given the power to go out. We see the world perplexed because of what just happened. We now see the Lord is healing these people. We know that there will be a healing absolutely for this group. And then when we come here, we get to Luke 9, 13. But he said unto them, give you them to eat. And they said, we have no more but five loaves and two fishes, right? This is the story of the five loaves and two fish, except we should go and buy meat for all this people. Now, remember, we're looking at this through the end time revelation, through end time eyes, as we call it. These are events that played out. But we're seeing the layer hidden underneath within the words. So there are these events that took place. But prophetically, we know that these things must be taking place during the seven days of the wedding. It has to be connected within it. And so far, we've got the anointing of the apostles. We got them being perplexed right in a place where the word perplexed in relation to the gospel should be if this is giving us a story of the wedding week. So now look what happens. In Luke 9, 14, for they were about 5,000 men, and he said to, to his disciples, make them to... Make them sit down by companies, uh, sorry, sit down by 50s in a company, okay? What is it to sit down? At a party, at a meal. Like to recline sitting down at a party meal. Well, you guys know where this is going, right? For those of you who have been around for a little while, not only is this word used once, but this word here, this group who is sitting down at this party meal, remember, this party meal that they're sitting down at is this meal for the bride is the prophetic picture. <coughs> it's, this, it's this wedding feast that is taking place 
in the third heaven. <coughs> Excuse me. This, remember, we're talking about that wedding week and these events that are taking place. He anoints the apostles. The world is is in awe. They're perplexed. And now what's having what's taking place in heaven? Well, there's a wedding taking place. And so we're seeing them being told to be sit, sit them down in companies of 50. And we see the word company, which is at a party, at a meal, they're reclining. And the word to sit down is used three times. All three times that this word is used is only found in the Gospel of Luke. And do you know what's exciting about this one? Those of you that have been around for a bit, you know where this is, right? <clears throat> this word for sitting down at a party is actually a dual reference. I'll show you what I mean. So this sit down, <clears throat> when we go to Luke chapter 14, we see in Luke chapter 14, the wedding banquet. Whoops, the wedding feast. Okay? And listen to what it says, starting in verse 7. And he put forth a parable to those which were bidden when he marked how, <clears throat> excuse me, how they chose out the chief rooms, saying unto them, <clears throat> When thou art bidden of any man to a wedding, sit not down in the highest room. Which word is that? It's the second time of its three times being used. So what is the story? We've done videos on this, right? We've taught on this. The wedding feast parable in Luke's gospel is the wedding that's taking place in heaven for the pre-trib bride. We've said it so many times, right? That when we're invited, once the pre-trib goes, anybody who is taken that is a part of this ministry will have heard about this, and there should be nobody who's a part of this ministry that's going to go and sit in the highest room. When we are invited, when we are taken pre-trib, if we are counted worthy, we are to sit down in the lowest room. And if there is an honor or something for some, then we would wait for somebody to come down and get those people and bring them up to the higher room. This is the revelation of the pre-trib bride of Christ. And in the seven-day picture of Luke 9, 1 through 27, is the picture of the wedding. So not only did he anoint them, what, what happened when he anointed them? When he anointed the apostles, we know that then he left in John chapter 20. He left and he didn't come back till the eighth day. And we know the pre-trib happened and the world would be perplexed. They would be in bewilderment. And then so what's now should be happening after those events? There should be the wedding. The wedding in which they're going to sit down at a banquet and have a meal. And it's the wedding feast uh, parable in Luke's gospel, which is the one directly related, as we have taught for a few years now, directly related to the pre-trib bride of Christ. Directly related. But when this wedding is over and the Lord returns about an eighth day, we know he's coming to meet with a group of people who didn't go to the wedding, right? That remnant bride group, that remnant portion, remnant Smyrna workers that were told to wait for their Lord when he returns from the wedding. He said he was going to have a meal with them too. And we know the prophetic picture in the parable of the great banquet in Luke 14, 12, because this isn't found in Mark, nor is it found in Matthew. Only the wedding feast is found in Matthew because we know there's a pre-trib wedding and there's a post-trib wedding, a Gentile and a Jewish one. But there's no great banquet parable anywhere except for Luke's. And that's because the Lord told the Luke remnant, the Smyrna group, that he's going to return. When he returns from the wedding, he's going to have a banquet with them. You see? And it's right here. And who are they? They're the ones that, are, that will be part of the resurrection of the just. Those who will have put their necks on the line. These aren't the, the apostles. These are the Smyrna disciples. 
the remnant bride workers. It's exactly who they are. And we've shared, we've done videos on this. They're the ones who are going to be in this banquet meal that the Lord is going to have when he returns on the eighth day after the wedding. And it's going to be for those who are part of the resurrection of the just, the ones who will put their necks on the line, who, as Smyrna says, will not, uh, um, which second death will not hurt them. Those are the ones who get to be resurrected at the end of tribulation and take part in the millennial reign, ruling and reigning with him as kings and priests. They're the resurrection of the just. They're the Smyrna, the, the Luke 12, 35, when he returns from the wedding. He's going to have a meal with them. So if he's having a meal with them, but this first one, this one here, is the meal that he's having at the wedding. You see, this isn't the one that he's having later. Because the one in Luke chapter 9 is showing us the revelation of him having the meal during the wedding. It's during those seven days. So where do we find the connection? Right there at the wedding. Right there in the wedding parable of Luke. Where's the third time we see this? None other than Luke chapter 24. Because Luke chapter 24 is the banquet that he has when he returns from the wedding with that banquet meal that is only found in Luke. The parable of that banquet meal. It's because this is the one that he has with the ones that represent that typology of the two on the road to Emmaus. And it's them that he told in Luke, 20, uh, in Luke 12, verse 35 through 38, that to be ready and girded about when he returns from the wedding, that when he comes, he would what? That they would open to him and he would sit down and meet with them and serve them. We've taught on it many times over the years how that only happens in Luke chapter 24 out of Luke, Mark, Matthew. He only sits down and eats with and serves one group. And it's this one here in Luke chapter 24 who are the picture of Smyrna and when he returns from the wedding to begin his 40 days after he's come back from the wedding and has then a meal where he will sit down and serve them and eat with them. This is that story. It's the same one. And look at this. In Luke 24, verse 30, and it came to pass as he sat at meat with them. There's the third time it shows up. All three of them, 100% directly related to that Luke group, which is why we see this breakdown only in Luke. From the, from, the, from the apostles being anointed and going out to the world being perplexed to, to the wedding meal typology in it and sitting down at the wedding feast. All of it just incredibly in order. And then what happens? Well, then we know that the Lord is coming back after that time frame of the eighth day, right? And what's the Lord going to do? Remember what happens first? Remember what happens first? He, he breathed on him, right? And then he left. Thomas wasn't there. And then he came what? After an eight days again, he came. So what do we know he's doing? We know he's going to meet with the apostles again, just briefly, before he goes and meets with the Luke Smyrna disciples, like the two of them on the road to Emmaus. Okay? So look at what happens now in Luke chapter 9. We then see the story of, in verse, chap in verse 20, uh, actually in verse 18, when he says, Who say the people that I am? They answered him saying, some say John the Baptist, some say Elias, Elijah, and others say that one of the old prophets is risen again. He said unto them, but who do you say that I am? Peter answering said, the Christ of God. And what does the Lord do? And he straightway charged them and commanded them to tell no man that thing. Isn't that wild? 
Didn't, didn't he come to be the saving Lord Christ? The prophetic picture here is wild. He's telling them, hey, hey, hey. Okay, I, the Spirit made these things known to you. But don't make this go out. Remember we've talked about this. It was, it's been a few years since we shared on this. Because we know when he comes as the Son of Man, he's not going around saying, Yo, I'm the Christ. I'm the Christ. Everybody come to me. Be healed. Oh, I'm... No. He's coming as the Son of Man. He's not coming to declare himself and tell everybody he's the Christ. He's coming to warn as Jonah did. Right? To warn as Jonah did. To represent the 40 days of Noah with the ark. Which within that time, we know from Luke 17, is when he's about to come. And we know that he meets with the apostles first, right at about that time of the eighth day. <coughs> Excuse me. He told us, even in Luke 17, not the lightning from one end to the other yet, <clears throat> but when he said, But first must he suffer many things and be rejected of this generation. He's got to be rejected of this generation, and it's going to be while he's here, warning as Jonah did for 40 days, as the story of Noah with the ark. So. We know that he's going to be rejected. We know that he's not going to be walking around saying, I'm the Messiah, come to me, right? And this is telling us exactly that. But the apostles are aware of it. And he says, oh, oh make sure you don't go tell them then. Don't go telling everybody that, that I'm the Lord, okay? And then you see in 22, 922, saying, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and chiefs and scribes and be slain and raise the third day. Remember, there's an incorporation of was, right? Or of is and of is to come. So we're seeing this same storyline in the prophetic when they ask him what will be the end of days, which is the Luke 17 answer. It's all of these things are literally detailing the 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 pre-trib anointing of the apostles, the the world being perplexed. The wedding taking place in heaven. How they're going to be arranged and sitting in heaven with the event that took place in the feeding of the 5,000, giving us a prophetic picture in the is to come of the wedding feast taking place. To then him coming at about that time of the eighth day where he's going to meet with the apostles again first, exactly as we know was going to happen. And then he says, uh, da 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 do in starting in verse in Luke 9 verse 23 and he said to all them if any man will come after me let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me for whosoever will save his life shall lose it but whosoever will lose his life for my sake the same shall save it for what is a man advantaged if he gain the whole world and lose himself or be cast away now here it comes for whosoever shall be ashamed of me and of my words, of him shall the Son of Man uh, be ashamed when he shall come in his own glory and in his father's and of the holy angels. You know what this is? This is now the prophetic speak of things that took place in the is that he was telling them it will be at the time of the pre-trib when he comes in his own glory in his father's and of the holy angels. This is connected to the pre-trib. And now we're getting again this pre-trib conversation where he says, but I tell you the truth, there be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the kingdom of God. You see, he was telling them the story of events. <coughs> He's laying all these things and all these things are playing out. And then he ends it by telling them that those of you who are here, some of you won't taste of death till you see the kingdom of God. Now, did that actually happen? Was there some sort of pre-trib where they got to be Enoched? No. Do you think it was him giving us that prophetic insight right here? Absolutely. And now we can see why his is the only one that says after these things. The after these things 
is the story that starts from verse one. There's it's laid out in the in the prophetic taking place of the events of the seven day wedding to when he comes again at about an eighth day. The people he meets with, the events of the wedding, the world being perplexed, all of it being played out exactly as it shows. It's wild. Now watch what happens with Mark. Mark and Matthew are much simpler. We don't have to go through a bunch of things. Look at what Mark says. In Mark 9, verse 1, we've got one verse. One verse. And he said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that there be some of them that stand here which shall not taste of death till they have seen the kingdom of God come with power. It's kind of strange, right? Of course, you don't have the rest of that wording like Luke had. We know now the after six days. But if this verse 2 is after six days, then that means verse 2 is what? Verse 2 is the after six days. Let me go to this one. Okay? Verse 2 is after six days. So there's our six days as years, which means verse 2. What did verse 2 say? After. After six days. What is after six days? It would be the start of the seventh year, which is what? Well, the, the 14 years. When the 50 days are done, the 14 years begin on the day and hour no one knows. So when you go to Mark's discourse, and we read, in Mark's discourse, which, by the way, wasn't in Luke's, and there's a reason for it, because it's 50 days before the day and hour no one knows. So what does Mark say? But of that day and of that hour knows no man. Because the after six days or after six years is going to begin on the day and hour no one knows Feast of Trumpets of 2030. Okay? So it's going to begin on... In September 2030, on the day and hour, no one knows. The Feast of Trumpets. Okay, the 28th to the 29th of September, unless the world gets thrown off tilter, it would still equal the after six days or years. Okay, but if the numbers of days continue as they do, it would be September 30th, 28th to the 29th. The day and hour, no one knows. Okay, you see it right there. The day and hour no one knows would be what? <laughs> this is so wild. You'll see why I'm harping on it. If this is the after six days of six years, then that means it is the day and hour no one knows of the start of the seventh year of seals. Okay? But... This came before the after six days or six years. You ready? What will they see at the tail end of the sixth year of seals? You see, not after six, not after six, because that's the day and hour no one knows that begins the seventh year of seals. The seventh six days and then the seventh day of unleavened bread, right? This verse 2 is the day and hour no one knows after the six years. But there is Mark 9 verse 1 that comes right before it. And it told us that they will have seen the kingdom of God come with power. Meaning they're going to see it coming with power, but they didn't yet go anywhere. But they will have seen it coming. And this would have to be what? Right at the tail end of the sixth year. Because this is after the sixth year. Which is the day and hour no one knows. So, if this is the end of it, verse 9, verse 1, is the very end of the sixth year, what if we go have a look and see what happens at the end of the sixth year of seals? 
Let's go to Revelation chapter 6 at the end of the what? Oh, well, let's go to the end of the sixth seal. The end of the sixth year of seals. Not the day after the last day of the sixth year, okay? But right before the end of the sixth year. They were told that they will have seen the kingdom of God come with power. But yet they didn't go anywhere yet. And look at what we see. Starting in verse 16. And the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bondman and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains and said unto the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of his wrath is come. And who shall be able to stand? Do you get it? The very end of the sixth year of seals, right at the end of it, at the end of the sixth year of seals, what are they seeing coming? They will have seen the kingdom of God come with power. Hello. The entire reason in this layout of the Gospels for Mark having verse 1 in right before the transfiguration is to tell us and line up for us. Do you see this level of detail? When I was saying layers and layers and layers of depth, the purpose of the way these chapters were laid out, as this one is now also proving, is that this one is telling us they're going to see the kingdom of God when the Messiah is coming on heavenly Mount Zion. They will see the kingdom of God coming with power. Before what? Before, right before that sixth year of seals is done. And what do they see? Literally, at the end of the sixth year of seals, they literally see the kingdom of God coming with power. It is the mountain carved without hands. It's the same story of Second Esdras. When they see Mount Zion, and he shall stand on Mount Zion. You see, on the top of Mount Zion, not Mount of Olives, because this is the end of the sixth year of seals. And Zion will come to be made manifest to all people. Look at that. Prepared and built. As you saw a mountain carved without hands. Look at what this is. The end of the sixth year of seals. Well, then what happens? It's He's coming with the place prepared. So they see it at the end of the sixth year of seals. They will have seen the kingdom of God come with power. And then what happens in the seventh year of seals? What happens in the seventh year of seals? Well, in the big picture, this is the 14th year, right? Remember Leah, Rachel? This would be the 14th year. And then you've got seven more for the 21 and then 22 of the Jubilee. So what happens in the 14th year? Well, according to 2nd Esdras, it would be the place prepared, furnished and prepared that the Lord went to, to prepare for them. Which means now, you see, they're going to see it where? This right here, Elul 29. <laughs> Wait till you see how this connects. <laughs> <laughs> Elul 29 is the last day of the sixth year, right? So in this late stage, or you could literally say Elul 29 being the end of the sixth year, when they will have seen the kingdom of God come with power connected to Elul 29, and then the seventh year will begin on the Feast of Trumpets of 2030, Tishri 1 or 2, and that will begin the seventh year. So now when the seventh year begins, what, what do we have that's connected to it? Well, let's go back into Mark chapter 9 and see what we find. First of all, let me show you what I was going at with the 14th, right? So you got the seven easy years that were kind of mysterious, right? From the creation. 
then you got the seven years of seal so it's the 14th year if the lord is coming and we saw in second esdras that he's coming on mount zion the place carved with the mountain carved without hands which is prepared and built and it's the end of the sixth year of seals and then the very next day is the day and hour no one knows of mark's discourse that's the beginning of the seventh year of seals which is the 14th year in the big picture do you know what that's directly related to it's directly related to john 21 chapters right for those who hadn't seen that before 21 chapters so all of these books have prophetic revelation in their chapters that relate to years of events so we've got john 21 chapters in the big picture of the 21 years and you go to chapter 14 of john which is the seventh year of seals right day no the day and hour no one knows to start the seventh year of of tribulation the seventh year of seals or in the big picture the 14th year if we go to John chapter 14, what what did 2nd Ezra say? He's now he's coming on heavenly Mount Zion, the place prepared and built. So if we go to John chapter 14, what did Jesus say this year starts with? In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where i am there you may be also in chapter 14 of john which is directly related to the seventh year of seals he's coming with what he's coming on heavenly mount zion he's coming with paradise the place prepared that they will have seen come with power and the very next verse then says after six days, which is the after six years of seals, which is the beginning of the seventh year of seals. And the scriptures tell us it's the day and hour no one knows in Mark's discourse, which is directly related to the feast of trumpets, the day and hour no one knows. Are you catching this? We're going to come to another piece soon in relation to Elul 29. Guys, it's so wild to, to track and to see all these things and what they're revealing and everything that they're saying. It's, it's just, it's so wild. It's so absolutely incredible. Now, let's go back into Mark 9. Actually, you know what? Now, because I don't want to go too far down this because I'm going to we're going to recycle through them one more time. Let's go to Matthew. So now you you get now you can see why is this before the after six? Because the end of the sixth year of seals before the six years are over, they will have seen the Lord coming with power with the kingdom of God. So awesome. Now watch Matthews in Matthew chapter 17. It starts right off with, and after six days. That's strange, right? So in Matthews, you're not getting any, any additional thing. It just says, after six days. That's where it starts, which means after six days is after this sixth year of trumpet judgments, which means it's the beginning of the seventh year of trumpet judgments, or the very beginning of of the the 14th year of tribulation and there was nothing given in advance nothing do you know why because he's not seen coming in the final moments like we see in revelation chapter 6 when he's coming on heavenly mount zion with paradise the place prepared remember what happens we know there's an again event that's going to take place. And in this again event, the people that he's having this conversation with don't realize this event is happening again. So what's the very first thing that's going to happen 
that they're all going to see. They're going to see the after six days. And what's the after six days? The, the beginning of the seventh year of trumpets. Which is, again, in Scripture, or in our calendar counts, it's September 2037, and it's when? The day and hour no one knows, first or second of Tishri. There, there, there's nothing coming before it. They're not going to see this, this understanding of events. So there's nothing of not even one blurb of scripture that starts before the transfiguration story in the chapter of where the transfiguration story is. So we saw in Luke's the seven-day typology play out that seven to the eighth day. In Mark's, so in Luke's, when we see this seven to the eighth day, its purpose is because when the Lord comes in the transfiguration story in Luke's in Luke's gospel, he's coming in the on the about an eight days, which is almost the eighth year, to begin the forty days of Luke's discourse. It's not the it's not the end of of a six or a seven year period or it's not exactly bang on because it's the 50 days that come first and it's the 40 within the 50 that starts from the eighth day so when you go to luke's discourse do you get the day and hour no one knows nope because it has nothing to do with luke it has nothing to do with his coming in luke's portion so this is when he's coming after the wedding to begin his 40 days as the son of man white horse rider and all of this is the prophetic built in layers of what's going to take place during that seven to the eighth day built into it and how were we able i was able to see this because of all of the revelation of these things that we've come to understand over the years and then we come to marks in marks it only has one thing. And you see, and again, I love that Luke's said after these sayings. Because Luke's is the only one filled with 27 verses of events that took place relating to what happens in those seven to the eight days. In Mark's, we know they will have seen the kingdom of God come at the end of the sixth year of seals. Right before the six years are over when he comes as Luke's, as Mark's discourse says, on the day and hour no one knows. But right before the day and hour no one knows, which is the end of the sixth year of seals, the end of Revelation 6, they will have seen him come with power with the kingdom of God. And what's part of the kingdom of God? Paradise is also part of the kingdom of God. The first Luke group was a taking. The second Mark group at the mid-trib, great multitude rapture, it's going to be a taking. But remember, it says they will have seen it come, but they still haven't gone. They still haven't gone. Because the harvest will begin for the spring wheat when he comes at the end of six years, when he comes on the day and hour no one knows, after they will have seen him come, now he's established to start the seventh year on the day and hour no one knows. But it doesn't begin with him taking the great multitude rapture group. We know Antichrist has been killed, right? He's not in the he's not in the lake of fire, but he's been killed. Right? His was has taken place. The the false prophet has fled away. The the ten kings, right, are, have been all those that came against the Ezekiel 39 war, it's, it was done. It's done at this point. Now when the seventh year starts of seals, it's the unleavened bread, the assembly time, which will begin with the 144 being sealed, right? That priestly Levitical line before the great multitude rapture. And then you have the seventh seal, which is silence in heaven for about the space of half an hour which I believe will equal the about six months or the five months remaining if it's second Passover for when the great multitude will finally come in. 
because they were what? Well, they'd be helping of burying the bones for seven months from the Ezekiel 39 war, which would then line up exactly for when this group would come in of the great multitude rapture in the seventh year, like unleavened bread, seventh day uh, assembly. So when we come to Mark's, in chapter 17, we saw that there was nothing. It's just bang. This is him coming as the as we said at the very start now on the day and hour no one knows of Matthew's discourse which is the beginning of that final 14th year but if you go back one verse you see why would they've laid it out like this why did Luke have so much more and laid out in his way Mark got the one verse like Matthew's but Matthew's is in the chapter before it's it's all purposeful. There was a reason why Matthew, Mark, and Luke have the info before very little, like one verse, and then nothing. It's all laid out like that prophetically on purpose. And so look at what we see on its own, the last verse, okay? So not correlated as to why we see the transfiguration, because now this is the chapter before. But look at what they did with Matthew. They stuck it at the end verse, of the chapter before instead of even laying it out the same way they did with mark why wouldn't it have been laid out the same way marks was there had to be a reason why call this the 28th verse why not call it matthew 17 1 and it would look similar to marks except for the wording was different you see what i'm saying simple things like that on why this would be the last verse of 16 and not the first verse of 17 when this same typology of conversation is the first verse in Mark 9, right before his transfiguration. It is purposeful. It is absolutely spirit-led revelation as to why these things were laid out the way they were. And of course, theirs is worded differently because Matthew's is in relation to when the Lord returns, feet down on the Mount of Olives, and it says, Matthew 16, 28, Verily I say unto you, there be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. You see, this is the return of the Lord, feet down on the Mount of Olives. That's the beginning of the 14th year, which again, we've revealed many times, is the beginning of the 14th year of tribulation, is the, is the 21st year of, right in the big picture is the seventh year of trumpet judgments it relates to when the lord returns of what we would generally always call because of seven years of seals and seven years of trumpets it is the 14th year of tribulation when he returns feet down on the mount of olives it's it's so wild what a what another awesome little insight we've been blessed with there but i'm not done I'm going to show you even a little bit more, and we still haven't gotten to the wine, but the wine won't take too long. Listen to what this says here. Some of it we've gone into in the past, so I won't spend uh, much time on it at all, except to point it out. But I want to show you something else that we saw, or that I had come across. In the time of the transfiguration, so when he comes to begin his 40 days, right? We come to Luke 9, verse 29. It says, And as he prayed, the fashion of his countenance was altered and his raiment was white and glistening. Look at that. Just radiant, white, glistening, right? A word being given to us one time. Interesting. There is a purpose for it. Okay, there is an understanding. And there is, there's a reason why the word is used once. When we come to Mark's, but look at what was what was glistening. Okay? What was what was being white and shining and everything else? It was his garment. In Mark's, when he comes, and then they see it, it's the day and hour no one knows. The seventh year of seals has begun. Okay? We come to verse 3, Mark 9, verse 3. And his garment became shining exceeding white as snow, so as no fuller on earth can white them. Again, what became shining exceedingly white? His garment. His garment. And what do we know about this? Let's touch on, look at this, this flash of intensity. 
one description only here in Mark's version. Luke had one for its own description. Mark had one for its own description. What else do we know? This incredible word for white. We've got white 3022, but then we've got this standalone word white in the same verse towards the end, which means to whiten or make white. Those of you who have been around for a while, you know exactly what this relates to. And this one is only used twice. Well, what is the transfiguration time? The transfiguration is the beginning of the seventh year of seals, which is the, the year that represents the day of the solemn assembly, which means it's when the 144 will be sealed and then the great multitude rapture will come in. So in fact, before I go to the white, we should probably start with what's mentioned first. Oh, yes, there's a reason for it, too. Why didn't, why wasn't, so as no fuller on earth can whiten, you see the word fuller comes before whiten. Let's see if we can understand why. The word fuller is only used once in the New Testament. When we went and looked it up, we've done a video on this, right? The word fuller is also found in Malachi chapter 1. And what does it talk about? It says, Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant, whom you delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. But who may abide in the day of his coming, and who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire, like fuller's Soap. What's the fuller for, guys? The fuller is the, the cleaning of clothes, right? So we see that it's connected to the time when the messenger of the Lord who prepares the way. Who's the messenger of the Lord who prepares the way? Whoever the end of day typology Elijah will be. Remember, John the Baptist is a prophetic typology of of the Elijah, but also of the Moses, the one that will die, and the other one, like Elijah, who goes up in a whirlwind, who won't experience death during seals, but when the Lord comes, will be part of the rapture group going in the um, going up in uh, uh, like Elijah did, right? Not having tasted of death, whereas John the Baptist, like Moses, did die. So, what do we see about this messenger related to Fuller's? Well, we keep reading. And it says in the Malachi 3, 3, and he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. And he shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as silver, as gold and silver, that they may offer unto the Lord an offering of righteousness. Then shall the offering of Judah and Jerusalem be pleasant unto the Lord as in the days of old and as the former years purify using like fuller soap to purify the sons of Levi who the Elijah person was the one who prepared the way for when the Lord came at the end of the sixth year of seals and once he has prepared the way the Lord comes as the fuller soap refiner and the first thing he's going to do is what purify and refine the sons of Levi. Well, the, the Levi's, the Levi are what? They're the, the priestly line, right? So, it would seem that if we go back to Mark and we follow the storyline, we see that when the Lord comes after six days, he's going to have that fuller soap for which he's going to what? Purify the Levites first before this whitening that takes place. Okay? Even though the context you see here, so as no fuller on earth can whiten them. But we know Jesus is the purifier of what? That will make them white? Well, look what happens. If we go to the seventh year and we go to Revelation chapter 7, according to what Levitic, uh, according to what Malachi said, the Levitical line 
or a priestly line, which we know are the 144,000, are being put through the fuller soap first. And then what did we see? Then there was the word whiten, which was only used once in Mark's gospel, and the only other place it's used is in Revelation chapter 7, which comes after the priestly line, that Levitical line. And we see it right here at the great multitude rapture. And what does it say about it in verse 13? Actually, in verse 14, Revelation 7, verse 14. And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said unto me, These are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white. And made them white. White. There's only two representations of people in the sixth year or after six years of seals. The 144 being sealed and the great multitude rapture. Who are the ones that helped them get there? Well, it connects to Moses and Elijah in the John typology. And it just so happens we don't read about this in Mark's, I mean, in Luke's version, but we only read about it for the first time going Luke, Mark, Matthew. We read about it in Mark. And they ask him about Elijah in Mark 9, 11. And they asked him saying, why say the scribes that Elijah must come first? <clears throat> and he answering, answering and told them, Elijah verily cometh first and restoreth all things. Remember we showed this when the when the son of man is coming for 40 days as we read as you continue to read down in Luke chapter 12 and you read down further 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 past the the three working groups and <clears throat> Jesus says in the picture of him coming for 40 days I am not come to bring peace but I am come to bring division right Three will be in five will be in one house, three against two, two against three, father against son, mother against daughter. Well, that's exactly what we read in Mark's discourse. Father against son, mother against daughter. It's the division that takes place during the time of seals, and the Elijah John the Baptist character in the midst of seals is the one who restores them. So here we are at the end. Of six years of seals the start of the seventh year he starts with the fuller on the refining of the priestly Levitical line and then you have the the white of the great multitude rapture and they ask him I thought Elijah comes first and he says Elijah did verily come first to restore all things and how it is written of the Son of Man that he must suffer many things and be set at naught but I say unto you that Elijah is indeed come, and they have done unto him whatsoever they desired. Right? Whatsoever they listed. You see that? You don't get this story of Elijah in Luke's portion. Because Elijah doesn't come to restore anything until the time of seals. He is part of that package group of people represented as the John the Baptist or the, the Moses and Elijah's as the two on the road to Emmaus. They represent the workers during the time of seals. Maybe they're led by a Moses and, a, and an Elijah type. But they are the two portions of people that remain that would be with them as a group, which I believe will be 12,000 and 12,000. But that's a separate story. But you see, so here we are at the end of six years of seals, in the seventh year, and Elijah did already come. And he did restore all things. And Malachi told us that the one who is to come to prepare the way. You see? This is the one, this is the one that relates to the is to come John the Baptist, Elijah. And when the Lord comes with the fuller and the purifying of the Levitical line, it will be when the Elijah type has restored the, the, the father and son. The division that the Lord brought during the 40 days because of this chaos. It's now time to come to Christ or not. 
when seals comes to an end, it is over for the world. The church age will be over. And it will now turn towards Judah. It's awesome. Again, these things and the way they're laid out and what is being told to us. And so what did we see in, in, in Luke? We saw this uh, similar type of raiment, right? But you get a different explanation. We see here, and his raiment became, uh, da -da -da, his raiment became shining, exceeding white as snow, so as no fuller on earth can whiten them. And now we've broken all of that down. But nothing about his face shining white. Neither was Luke's. Look what happens now when we go to Matthew. Matthew chapter 17. We now know that this is when he's returning feet down on the Mount of Olives. It should relate to Matthew chapter 24 when the Lord is returning on the day and hour no one knows and it would be as it was in the days of Noah which represents the final 14th year of tribulation. Look at what Matthew 17 verse 2 says. And was transfigured before them and his face did shine as the sun. Wait, Luke and Mark were both about the raiment. This is the only one that tells us that his face did shine as the sun. His face is shining as the sun and his raiment was white as the light. Well, what is this word for light, guys? We share on this all the time. This is the light of Jesus. So his face did shine. As what? As the sun. Look at this. As the rays of the sun, right? From what? Where does the sun rise? From east. So when the sun comes up from the east and he is shining, his face is shining as the sun, he is coming from the east and it's shining to the west. Right? Straightforward. Well, let's see where this word shine is found. It's only used seven times in Scripture. Let's see. It's used seven times in Scripture. And if I remember correctly, two of them relate to Gospels and the rest are outside of the gospel. So look at what we got. <clears throat> there we go. Three times in Matthew and once in Luke chapter 24. That is purposeful. And I'm going to show you why. Why on earth, if it's all related to Matthew and the Lord coming when he returns feet down on the Mount of Olives, why would it be in Luke chapter 17? Well, let's remind again that this is the final 14th year when the Lord returns feet down on the Mount of Olives in his day. When his face is shining like the sun that comes up from the east and shines to the west. If we go to Matthew 24, knowing that this is him coming on the day and hour no one knows, immediately after the tribulation of those days, when he comes, right, as lightning from one unto the other? Let's see if we can prove this out. <clears throat> In Matthew chapter 24, verse 27, look at what we get. For as the lightning that cometh out of the east and shineth unto the west, Sun comes up, shining face like the sun coming up from the east and shines unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. And what is the coming of the Son of Man? When he comes on the day and hour no one knows, which will be as it was in the days of Noah, which is when he starts the final 14th year, which will be the day of his coming. Shining as the sun from the east to the west. And the word we were given 
is used seven times, four times in the Gospels, three in Matthew, but one time in Luke. Now, why on earth would it be in Luke? Well, when we saw chapter 17, I'm sure you guys got it right away, right? Those of you that have been around for a while, you know exactly what I'm going to. In verse 24, it came up, sorry. When it says, for, remember, and this is prophecy. They're asking him what it will be at the time of the end, at his coming. And in verse 24, he says, For as the lightning that lighteth out of one part under heaven, remember that? From the, cometh out of the east and shineth unto the west, okay? Shineth unto the other part of heaven, so shall the Son of Man be in his day. What is that day? It is the day that he returns, feet down on the Mount of Olives. And what is that day? The year of his vengeance. You see how it all ties together? A day is as a year, a year as a day. It is the prophetic revelation. When he comes in his day, feet down on the Mount of Olives, what did the after six days of Matthew say? That his face would be shining as the sun. What is the lightning from one end unto the other as it shines from the east to the west when he comes in his day? As it said in Matthew 24, 27, it's the exact same as we revealed from Luke 17, 24, when he's coming in his day and he gives them the end before he goes to the beginning. Look at this word, for shineth. It's the same one. It's the one from Matthew, only used once in Luke, and the reference of it in Luke is exactly what we have been saying here in this ministry for years, that this is the Matthew 24 reference from when he then goes to verse 25 and says, but first, because this but first is the beginning of his 40 days that relates to the Luke portion in his transfiguration story. So this is your transfiguration of him coming at the 14th year when he returns feet down in his day, which is the day as the year of his vengeance. And when he says, but first must he be rejected and suffer in this gener of this generation, he's referring back to the Luke transfiguration story when he comes to begin his 40 days, and it's the Luke discourse, when it represents his 40 days warning as Jonah, whereas this one was his reference of Matthew's discourse when he comes as lightning from one end unto the other. You see how crazy this all is? How could we possibly know or understand anything without this being unequivocally Holy Spirit led the entirety of the way through. Awesome. Absolutely incredible. So now with that, let me give you one more juicy little piece of revelation in this. I only use this with Jesus and the wine so that I would remember the division of where I was going next with this. Watch this. Let's go to Luke chapter 22 in relation to the Last Supper. Now, I'm not here to dispute or to really say much on, you know, on whether this Last Supper was really a Passover meal. Our brother um, Roy had been sending me things over the years, too, that he had studied and other people had studied to say, look, the 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 Passover meal that they had it wasn't really a Seder. It, it was it was some sort of banquet meal that is being referenced in it. We've talked about it a couple times in the past. But I'm going to show you this in relation to the Last Supper and the story of the wine. So here we are in Luke chapter 22. And we're going to go through Luke, Mark, and Matthews. And we're going to start in verse... Yeah, let's start. Let's start in verse 16. It says, for I, this is the Lord speaking, for I say unto you, I will not any more eat. 
I will not anymore eat, which means what? The Lord is there eating it with them. Remember the story? This is why I said I wanted to tie it in because it fits precisely with what we've been talking about. Because the Lord said when he returns from the wedding, right? You could say whether you want to say it's the wedding or that remnant group that he has a banquet with. It's the same context. Listen to what it says. For I say unto you, I will not any more eat. Well, we know with this pre-trib group that he's going to what? He's taking them to the banquet meal. He's having a meal with them. It's a banquet meal, relaxing, sitting down and having a banquet meal. <clears throat> he says, therefore, unto, so he says, uh, for I say unto you, I will not any more eat, which means he was eating thereof. I will not any more eat thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Which means what? He was saying in the is when this was happening. That he's no longer going to have any food, any meal with them until he has it. What? In the kingdom of God. When is this meal going to be fulfilled in the kingdom of God? At the pre-trib banquet. At the pre-trib wedding. Remember the, the meal, the, the reclining at the meal? At the wedding meal? He told them he's no longer going to eat any more with them till he does it in the kingdom of God. Which means he's not having this meal anymore until he has it at the bridal wedding. That's what he's talking about. Listen to what 17 as we keep going. It says, and he took the cup, gave thanks and said, take this and divide it among yourselves. OK, so we know he had the meal with them and we know the remnant group. He had a meal with them, whether you want to say at the wedding or that he has a meal with them when he comes for the workers, when he returns from the wedding. He's going to now fulfill it in the kingdom of God with the wedding but he's also going to have a meal with him at the banquet. But now listen to what he says. He gives them the wine and says, take it among yourselves. For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God come. You caught that right away, didn't you? You've been tracking this tonight, haven't you? Look at what this says. Until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. I got to change this crappy color. Until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Okay. This means this, this actually would have to be the wedding banquet. Okay. The, the, the wedding meal. But look at what he says about the wine. He says, divide it among yourselves. For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine. So he's not having any of it. And he won't have any of it until what? Until he has it in the kingdom of God? Nope. Until the kingdom of God shall come. Hello. So when is the Lord saying he's going to have the wine? Dun, 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 dun. Remember what happened in, Luke, in Mark chapter 9? Verse 1. And he said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that there be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they have seen the kingdom of God come with power. He's coming with heavenly Mount Zion, paradise, to receive them unto himself, that where he is there they may be also, which is the kingdom of God come. So he's telling the Luke remnant workers that he is now not going to be drinking any wine until what? Until the end of seals. He's not going to drink any more of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. He's not having it until the end of the sixth year of seals. That's what he's saying. Now watch this. Watch this. We'll now go into Mark's. Listen to how Mark's plays out. Mark chapter 14. Oh, and in fact, you know, I guess we don't really need to go into it. We've done it already, right, in the past. We were talking about, 
you know, uh, it's a taking, a taking, and a return back in the beginning, right? How it's, there's a pre, a mid, they're both a taking of the kingdom of God, and then the third one is the returning of the Lord. Well, when we come to Luke's Last Supper, when they had to go and prepare a place, we know that it, in Luke 22, 12, it says, and he showed, uh, and he shall show you a large upper room furnished. You guys remember this, right? Above the ground. It's only used twice. It's used once in Luke's, and then, of course, in Mark's. And in Mark's, it's not just furnished, but we see that this upper room, there's the second place because they both pertain to the kingdom of God, okay, which, are in, which is part of heaven. That's in the kingdom of God. And when he comes with the kingdom of God at the end of the sixth year of seals, he's coming in the large, with the large upper room where he's going to gather them, but it's what? Furnished and prepared. You see how powerful that is? You see how absolutely connected that is? And it just so happens it's in Mark chapter 14. Because remember, in Luke's God in Mark, in uh, sorry, in John's gospel, it's chapter 14, because it represents in the 21 to 22 year big picture, it represents the 14th year. And what is it? It's furnished and prepared because now he's coming with the place prepared exactly as second Esdras was saying. When heavenly Mount Zion, the place prepared and built will now be there for them. So now we know that he has come with the kingdom of God. And we saw that in Luke's, he said he would no longer drink until he does it when the kingdom of God comes. <clears throat> so in relation to Marx, there's probably going to be a connection to drinking wine. Let's see what it says. Starting in Mark 14, 23, and he took the cup and when he had given thanks, <coughs> excuse me, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and they all drank of it. <coughs> excuse me. So the question is, does all drank of it? Does it mean Jesus? Yes, it does. You're going to see. And he said unto them, this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many. Verily, I say unto you, listen to this. I will drink no more. Which means he did drink. Which means he did drink. In Luke's, he said he would not drink until the kingdom of God comes. Well, in Mark, we know this is all about the kingdom of God having come when he came with the place prepared, which is directly related to when he comes with paradise. So the kingdom of God has come, as we know, at the end of the sixth year of seals. And now what, he's gonna, now what is he going to do? Well, the kingdom of God has come. So what did he do? He drank of the wine. And then he tells them, but now I will no, long, no more drink of the fruit of the vine until the day that I drink it new in the kingdom of God. You see? So we went from not doing it to then doing it when the kingdom comes. So you've got the two versions of the is of when it took place back in those days and played in a word play within them for the reason they were different in their wording is to relate to then when he comes at that point and he will drink it with them in the kingdom of God. Did you catch something? Watch this. This is so wild. This is something that our sister caught. She, but she caught enough to understand there was something to it, but not fully, not, it wasn't fully there yet. Okay? Uh, this cup is the New Testament. You see, look at when he divides it among them and they drink it, and he won't do it till the kingdom of God come. There, there's no when he's going to drink it new. When he's going to drink the wine new. It's not found in Luke. Okay? This is just about the New Testament. It's not about when he drinks it anew. Okay? It doesn't exist in Luke's gospel. When you come to Mark's, and we now understand that he's going to drink it, and he does drink it in Mark's because it represents the kingdom of God having come. Look what happens. 
He then goes on to say, in, as we just read in verse uh, Mark 14, verse 25, Verily say, I say unto you, I will drink no more of the fruit of the vine, of the vine, of the fruit, sorry, of the vine, until that day that I drink it new in the kingdom of God. Why new? Why would he give a reference of like new wine? You see, new wine like what? Fresh new wine. <laughs> like fresh new wine. Okay, look at look at this. We're, we're going to just dig in and see like new, young, fresh wine. So he's talking about, I'm not going to drink it again till I drink it again fresh, new when the kingdom of God comes. Well, it wasn't found in Luke's. And he wouldn't drink any wine in Luke's until the kingdom of God comes. Now the kingdom of God comes in Mark, which is the end of the sixth year of seals. They will have seen him come. And there he was having seen him come with the place prepared. And at the time of the new is when he's going to drink it. At the new is when he's going to drink it. And it's the end of the six year seals. Don't worry, I'll get to it in a moment. Let me finish up and then we'll track it back and show why it's in Mark and in Matthew. Now, what do we get in in Matthew's gospel? You get a complete different story. We're at it in the Passover one. Remember, it was two of them going into a, a place above right off the ground because they're two are part of the kingdom of god which is the third heaven and paradise what is the matthew one my time is at hand we know he's been betrayed right he's been betrayed by the 30 pieces of silver we know his time's at hand we know that there's going to be the again that happens at the end of the sixth year of trumpets or the end of the 13th year of tribulation and then he's going to return feet down on the mount of olives right and listen to what he says in Matthew chapter 26. Uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. Let's start in verse 26. It says, and as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and break it and gave it unto his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks, uh, sorry, and gave thanks and gave it to them saying, drink ye all of it. For this is my blood, the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit. Interesting, right? Of this fruit, because in Luke and Mark, he said of the fruit. So you got two different pieces, two different portions. So He's saying of the fruit, and here he's saying of this fruit of the vine, until that day when I will drink it new. When I will drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. So that's, again, his reference to when he returns feet down on the Mount of Olives relating to the end of the tribulation, to, the, to that 14th year at the end of 13 years. But what do we see? To wrap this all up in this final little tidbit of info, we end up finding out not only again revealing the timings of these things, proving out all of the prophetic revelation the entirety of the way through, but to put a little exclamation point on the end of it all, Luke does not have the word new when the Lord is talking about what? Wine. When he talks about drinking the wine and doing it again new. Which means he is drinking new wine. At each time of his coming. That he will drink it new. But it's not in Luke's. Do you know why it's not in Luke's? Because it can't be in Luke's. Because this is the pre-trib in Luke's. And this is when the Lord returns to begin his 40 days as the son of man 
to warn as Jonah for Luke's portion, for the Luke transfiguration story, for the Luke new wine, when he said he won't drink of the wine until he comes and, and until the kingdom of God comes, which means he's not drinking any wine here. He's only eating food, but will not drink the wine till the what? Till the kingdom of God come. So there is no reference to new, nor could there be. Because this is not the time of new wine when he comes to begin his 40 days as the white horse rider. So Luke's has no reference to the time of when the wine will be new when he'll drink it again. When he comes at the end of the sixth year of seals, when is he coming? September 2030, right? What is the last day of the year, brothers and sisters? What is the last day of the year? And what did Mark say? In Mark chapter 1, this is the beginning of the seventh year, the day and hour no one knows, after six years, which is the start of the seventh. And what did this represent? The final day of the year, when they will have seen the kingdom of God come. And when did Jesus say in, in Mark's, that he would then, I mean in Luke's, that he would next drink wine? That he would not drink wine until the kingdom of God come. And if this represents like a typology of the final day of the year, because this represents the start of the seventh year, which is the day and hour no one knows, and then this is the day before when the kingdom of God has come, what day would that be? It would represent the time of the 29th of Elul. <laughs> Excuse me. And so what would that mean for Matthew? It would also be the 29th of Elul, which would be 2037. And the Lord is coming what? On the day and hour, no one knows. And what does it start with? What is the end of the 13th and this period right here? When he comes at the day and hour, no one knows. What is this period of time right here in 2030? The 29th of Elul to the start of the day and hour, no one knows. New wine. New wine. Are you kidding me? It's the story of new wine, brothers and sisters. It's not found in Luke's because in Luke's, he's not here during the time of new wine. When he comes at the end of six years and he comes at the end of the 13 years, in both cases, he's coming at the time of new wine, which is the time of Elul 29, because Elul 29 is what? Elul 29 is true Pentecost, the 50 days that come after the 49, which is the 50 days of the period called above. And it's also what? Where men were being accused of being drunk on what? Well, here's what it said in Mark and Luke, new and fresh. What if we go to Acts chapter 2 and see what new wine means at Pentecost, which is directly, it is exactly what he said in Luke when he would have it, which would be Mark chapter 9, verse 1, at the end of the sixth year, when he would have new wine, when he would drink it new again, in freshness, new wine. What is the definition of new wine? Sweet, fresh, new wine. Sweet, fresh, juice, wine, right? Look at that. And when is he coming, guys? The end of six years, they see him right at this point, which is the time of new wine. And at the end of 13, it is the time of new wine and him coming feet down on the day and hour no one knows. And both of them, he said he would not do it until he came again and drank it new at his coming, which in both cases are the time when the new wine is ready. Come on. How many times do we have to do this? And you know what? It's not about how many times do we have to do it. It's that it can continue to happen forever. This is the revelation of Jesus Christ. This is the prophetic revelation of the opening of the books from Genesis to Revelation. Layer after layer after layer after layer. This is the kind of stuff that people have, have dreamed of being able to, to understand for centuries who have sought prophecy. 
But it could not happen till the final generation. And we've been so blessed. And I don't mean me. I mean all of us. That the Spirit has opened our understanding. Opened our eyes and our ears to be able to, to perceive and track and understand what's going on. Because what does it do for each of us who get it? It gets us on fire, as I said in the beginning, to diligently seek and search him out more than we ever have ever in our lives. I can speak that of myself, and I know that from many emails and comments I've received. Look at guys. When is the time of new wine? When is the wine harvest? Wine harvest season in the northern hemisphere, just like Jerusalem also is. Look at that. Late August to the end of October. It's that September to October period as I have been relating over and over and over and over again, proving that it is impossible for seven weeks of putting the sickle to wheat back in starting in March, April, when it's just starting to pop out of the ground, and then try to say that this is the end of your seven Sabbaths. But what's even crazier is the church trying to tell us that Shavuot or Feast of Weeks, according to the he the Jews count, is also Pentecost. Because there is no such thing as wine being ready at this time either brothers and sisters this is the revelation the seven sabbaths have begun the first sabbath is over we have six more sabbaths to go to the eighth of av and the pre-trib escape that will then begin the 50 days of the above 14 years that will take us from the fasting and mourning of the fifth month to the fasting and mourning of the seventh month of which the Son of Man will begin his 40 days after the week wedding related to the Feast of Weeks one day event. He will begin his 40 days. When his 40 days come to an end, it will be not many days to the 50th day, true Pentecost on the 29th of Elul when the literal wine is harvest ready every single year. Just as I proved when the wheat is ready to begin its harvest for the winter wheat and the seven Sabbath count of the Feast of Weeks. Brothers and sisters, it's in order and it gets proved out. Teaching after teaching after teaching, the Spirit is absolutely revealing. It is leading the... It, I don't even know what to say anymore. This was this was kind of some surface things, but also some very, very in-depth things to track. But the 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 real meat and potatoes outside of adding the, the revelation, the info with the wine, was to track and follow the understanding of why Luke had so many verses laid out the way it was before his transfiguration, before seeing what Mark had as one verse in the chapter before the transfiguration compared to Matthew having none and starting with the transfiguration. It is all revealed by the Spirit led from the division of the books in their chapters to the division of the verses, the way they were laid out on the page Per chapter. And the revelation of the end of days and the opening of the books that has been happening here for seven years has proven each and every one of those parts and pieces to be truly revealing the Spirit having led it all, just as is happening here. Brothers and sisters, I pray you take the time, absorb it, seek and search this all out, track it, follow it, read it through for yourself. I pray it blesses you, it excites you, and strengthens you even more because the time is undoubtedly at hand. I love you, brothers and sisters. God bless you and your families. I look forward to meeting you all, standing face to face prayerfully in the presence of the Lord in six more Sabbath weeks. I love you. 
God bless you. We'll talk to you soon. Bye for now.